Good evening, friends. So, yeah, I can see some old friends in the satsang. I have Brahmachari Vineet and uh, Julia. I welcome you in Sunday satsang at Pune. So, we also have some new devotees. I am not knowing their name, but soon I will be knowing after the uh, when we will meet after the satsang. So, this is a satsang, as we know, is based on the Rays of One Light book, which was written by Swamiji, and it is it's a testimony of the Christian and the Sanatan Dharma teachings, which uh, Yogananda, which which was the mission of Babaji. In fact, as we know that Babaji wanted that Yogananda should go to the West and should try to tell everybody that these teachings are not different; they are actually one. So this is a beautiful book, and for every week. Swamiji has given us one teaching. So the teaching for the week this week is, which is week 34, how should we meet our tests? And so when I read that, you know, I said, you know, these tests, they never come to an end. Yesterday I was with my daughter for her test in her school. And uh, tomorrow my wife is appearing in one more test. <laughs> Which, so I was wondering whether these tests will ever end because uh, on one end, you know, our children are appearing and on one end as a parent, we are appearing in the test. But are these tests ever going to an end, come to an end? And Swamiji, in fact, once said that all these tests are basically to prepare us for the final exam of our life. And what is the final exam? The final exam is actually when we go from this planet and if we can go joyfully and uh, become one with the light from which we have come that will be the like the final culmination and we can say oh yes i have passed the exam of my life with flying colors so yes let us read in this teaching what are the tests why do they come and how we can overcome them Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Last week, we considered Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism by John. We discussed the question, does Satan exist? All of us experience temptation of one kind or another in our lives. Some of us frequently, others only occasionally. Whether temptation comes to us from our own subconscious or from outside ourselves is secondary to the fact that it does come and that we must deal with it. More important then is the question how to deal with it. In fact, how to deal with tests of any kind. Martin Luther flung an ink pot at the devil who had appeared to test him. A dark stain on the wall of Luther's cell is pointed out to tourists in support of this story. Unfortunately, our trials are not often so summarily dismissed. As a fellow monk once said to Swami Kriyananda, speaking of Satan, if only I could get my hands on him. Jesus, during his temptations in the wilderness, overcame them and thereby set an example for all time by clinging the more determinedly to God. As Paramansa Yogananda used to say, Darkness cannot be driven out of a room with a stick. Once you turn on the light, however, the darkness will vanish as though it had never been. Jesus manifested this principle. The Bible tells us, therefore, that at last the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. In the Bhagavad Gita, the point is clarified further by the added explanation that there are three qualities in human nature, sattvic, spiritually elevating, rajasic or ego activating, and tamasic or spiritually darkening. It is this triune aspect of human nature that the third chapter refers to with the words, as fire is hidden by smoke, as a mirror is dulled by rust, and as an embryo is enclosed in the womb, so is the indwelling self enveloped by desire. Yogananda explained that each of these examples describes one of the qualities of gunas. Sattva gun, that which elevates our consciousness, can be freed of any identity with the ego by a little puff of meditation and right affirmation. Rajagun, which embroils the ego in restless activity, can be worked off with a little more and a little longer effort. Tamogun, on the other hand, embracing as it does 
such mental states as laziness and stupidity can only be outgrown in time since it inhibits even the desire for self-improvement. The example Jesus gave us was intended more for those in whom Sattva Guna is predominant. But if you yourself find elements in your consciousness that resist even the effort to cling to God in prayer and meditation, don't despair. Patience, as it has been well said, is the fastest path to God. As long as your efforts take you steadfastly in the right direction, you will come out right in time. Remember Yogananda's words, a saint is a sinner who never gave up. If, however, you, your nature impels you, even against your will, to move in the wrong direction, toward egoic desires and away from God, strive at least to detach yourself mentally from your wrong actions, which are induced by habit. The time will come when their own stored up energy will tire and diminish. At that time, if you have not contributed to that energy by your consenting will, you will find it possible at last to redirect your energies more constructively. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. This teaching was reminding me of a beautiful uh, excerpt. In fact, this, this I just came to know about a few days ago where I never knew that in Mahabharata, Krishna actually met Duryodhana also for this particular reason that when he went to Duryodhana and he wanted to avoid war and the battle at all costs because battle cannot give anybody anything as we know. These are very interesting times. We are you know, people are aligning, countries are aligning, nations are aligning for a, who knows, maybe another battle. But the thing was that the, when Krishna went to Duryodhana and he was asking him, Duryodhana, what is the matter with you? Why can't you understand? Can't you see what is right, what is wrong? Is it too difficult to separate, to discriminate between the right from the wrong? And Krishna, as he himself was God incarnate, even the presence would have been uplifting for anybody, even for an evildoer for that matter. Very interestingly, when Duryodhana answered him, he said, it's not Krishna that I don't know what is right from the wrong. Now, this is very interesting because on one hand, we feel that Duryodhana was a maybe an evil guy. He didn't know what is, he had no discrimination. But when he said, I know, I know what is right and what is wrong. And then you wonder why was he doing what he was doing? But then he said, but I cannot help it. He said, I know what is right and I know why you are here. I know what, wish, what should I do, but somehow I cannot help it because there is something in me that which is pushing me, which is pushing me to do what, what all that I'm doing. And uh, so it's, it is just what it is and I can't do anything about it. So this is how the story goes. But the thing is that we must have encountered, I have personally encountered this in my own life many times when I knew that, yes, this is what I must do. This is right. But somehow I was not able to, or because something, something or the other was pulling me down or uh, in the moment of an action, let us say, I forgot about it. Or let us say I later on realized, or maybe I felt maybe I should not have done it, but what was it? What was that that pushed me or that forced me to do or even knowingly what is right and what is not? Still, I did what was not right. So the thing here is, which uh, what is that force? Even in the previous chapter, which was the last week's satsang, uh, Yogananda describes that it is, it is the inner inclination. It is the inner tendencies, the habit patterns that we are carrying from incarnations altogether, which create a momentum in our subconsciousness. And as a result of those inclinations, we attract similar thoughts, which are at a similar wavelength, because Yogananda said that these thoughts are not individually rooted. These thoughts are universally rooted, which is to say that thoughts, they are not your own. You may think that these are my thoughts, but they are not your own because these thoughts are just moving like radio signals. And depending upon our 
inclinations and tendencies we are catching the appropriate thoughts so our job is to ultimately keep tuning to the higher thoughts keep elevating keep uplifting our consciousness so that we can tune into the right thoughts and thoughts are the only you can say fuel for the action because every action behind every action is nothing but a thought which gives it the force so how should we meet our tests on one level these tests are nothing but you can say these tests are exactly what we need to grow to evolve so on some on some on certain parameters let us say we are doing well we have done well in the past incarnations on certain other parameters we have not done so well so these tests will come not for the areas which on which you have already gained the strength but certainly for those areas in which we are lacking the strength and to make us stronger so these let us you know as uh, krishna here is describing that yes we have sattva guna raja guna and tamo guna these are the three qualities and depending upon if we have a sattva guna dominant then it doesn't need much refinement even a little meditation can help you to understand who you are but if there is a lot of raja guna dominant if there is a lot of restlessness in our mind then he said yes patience will help you patience will help us and yes let the let that momentum die down but it is the tamogun which requires a little more effort on one level it doesn't help us much because the the power of tamoguna is very strong it will it will just you know you cannot sometimes avoid it but then swami gives a very important key he said you can still even if you find yourself in the thick of action doing what you should not be doing still mentally resist still he says don't give the consent of your will just mentally resist try to make yourself understand this that this is not who i am this is i am pure consciousness this is something which is going through me but i am not this and he said time will come when 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 you when you will not give the consent of your will time will come that this momentum will die down and ultimately you will be able to go beyond it having said that you know we i want to further simplify this subject because we often talk about in satsangs the five ingredients uh, or we sometimes call them the five s's of a disciple they all begin with s and i am also going to now add three more to them which i feel are the siddhis which come to every devotee once we practice those five s's so many of you already know this is just a revision of what we have understood so how to meet the test so how can we strengthen ourselves to meet the test so let us say the first thing in fact the first two things are very easy everybody can do it all of us do are doing it the first is satsang come to satsang the more we come to satsang the more often we come to satsangs we are sharing a lot of light and con right consciousness among ourselves that itself is has a very powerful effect and influence on our consciousness and when we come to the satsang feel you know that what are you giving to the satsang let us say uh don't come just to satsang just to receive you will receive anyway because it's a it's a meeting point of devotees everybody is coming here but what are we bringing here maybe you are bringing a gift of your devotion now that's a wonderful thing gift of devotion you are bringing to the satsang maybe you are bringing a gift of high consciousness to the satsang the what, because just ask yourself i am going to satsang what i am what am i going to give today to the satsang that is one thing secondly study the scriptures swami ji has written more than 150 books each one of them is a scripture india is a land of scripture you know we have i'm quoting something from mahabharata some days we quote from ramayana some days you quote shankaracharya some days you quote from ashtavakra gita i mean just name it india is the jagat guru so india is a land of scriptures but still you need the refinement in every age and for that reason these great masters come to you know simplify so that we are not misquoting anything are we understanding the quote in the right context so studying the scriptures the swadhyay is very important because every scripture when you read in india i think it's a common 
thing to read Ramayana at home. In our homes also, we had Bhagavad Gita. I used to read Bhagavad Gita when I was a school going student. I don't know how much I used to understand it then, but this was like a ritual. Yes, do puja, do this thing, which I think in all, most of the Indian homes we have. So studying the scripture is a beautiful way of coming and absorbing the right consciousness, absorbing the light. The third thing, which I feel is also easy is to become a supporting member, is to give a part of your energy in whatever form, even if you give just one person, fine. Swami at one time said, give at least 10 person, but just give something because the more the, the, when you give something or share your energy, it refines your consciousness because you are adding your energy to the pool of Guru's light, Guru's work, and that will refine us. And as we share the energy, which can be by becoming a supporting member, it can also be in the form of Seva. So when you work for God's work, that Seva also uplifts us. So these are the four S's. If you, if we can enumerate again, the Satsang study of the scripture, the uh, supporting membership and Seva, which I feel are the four pillars on which rests what? The fifth S, which is our sadhana. Now, this is something important because many times we wonder why I'm not growing in my sadhana. Is, is, is this is, uh, something more I can do? Can I improve? Can I become better? The only thing which one has to ask is, what am I doing about the four pillars of sadhana? Is something on some pillar I'm weak? Do I need to strengthen one of the pillars there more? Because on these four pillars only, you can have a temple of sadhana. If you're only focusing on sadhana, the pillars are weak. I mean, you can very well imagine if the foundation is weak, what is going to happen? After these five S's, what are the three siddhis that are going to come? And which will help us to deal with the tests. As you saw in the last line with Swami's quoting, that even when you uh, find yourself in the thick of an action, and you're not able to avoid it, mentally resist it. Do not give it the will. So how can you do that? Do that. The necessary ingredient there is self-control. Now that is the sixth S, which comes naturally. Sixth S will come as a self-control. Even in the thick of an action, you will have control over yourself to withdraw. And it's like somebody asked one yogi who said, sir, you are practicing sadhana for so long, what ha are, have you really benefited from it? He said, yes, I have uh, benefited, I felt. And uh, the question, the answer he gave was very interesting. He said, yes, I do get irrit irritable sometimes. I do get, you know, I do, I may get angry also. Earlier also, I used to get angry. Now also I'm getting angry. So what is the difference? He said, the difference is that my threshold has definitely gone up that I'm not getting angry over trivial matters, or I'm not getting disturbed by trivial day-to-day -day things of the life. And so this is something, why is this happening? Because that sixth S is helping him. That self-control is coming to him as a blessing. And so that he can see what is happening. The seventh S which comes is the Santosha, which, which is the highest virtue, as we say that this santosha suddenly you realize that god has already given you everything you don't need anything he has already made you complete as the soul as a child of god you don't need to grab anything once you have santosha and self-control you can sail through life you can understand that there is nothing much you can whatever tests will come yes tests will continue to come but you know that you have santosha you have self-control and finally the last s which which is the you can say icing on the cake is the s of self-inquiry you know self-inquiry as ramana maharishi used to say that's but there was one devotee you know who said sir when will i find god and uh, uh do i uh will i be able to see god but just like i'm seeing you he said, of course, you will be able to see him just like you are seeing me. He said, but sir, when, when this is going to happen? Is this at the end of my life? Is this going to happen 
when and uh, Ramana Maharishi said, yes, it might happen once uh, you leave this body. And uh, but then what will what will happen, how it will happen? So what will I ask God or what will what will God talk to me? He said, yes, he said the way you are talking. He said, yes, exactly the same way God will talk to you. And then he said, OK, when I go to Vaikuntha, is that uh, he said, yes, then also you will find God hey, there. God will be you will be seeing God just like you're seeing me. But then what will God ask me? He said, then he said, God will ask you only. Are you, he said, are you, uh, what is uh, the, the, because he was a, he was a master of uh, self, the, 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 the kind of, you know, yes. The question he said is, was, was that God will only ask you that, uh, have you understood this question? Who are you? He said, that's what, that was a question that he's going to ask you only one question. Have you understood? Who are you? Which is actually the only question which under which uh, which is all about. And Rogananda kept the name of the organization self realization. Why did he keep it? Because at the end, we all have to understand who we are. And on one side, you know, Christ, uh, Christ is saying, "Ye are gods. All that you have to do is be still and know that ye are God." But then. Are we able to understand that? And that, so the last S, which will come as a Siddhi, and that is also as a blessing, as Swami, as Yogananda himself said, that it will come as a natural inevitab inevitability to a devotee, that the blessing of self-inquiry is to understand who we are. And that self-inquiry will be nothing but to understand that this pure consciousness is all that I am. And all these thoughts are just playing on that screen. I have nothing to do with the with those thoughts. I have nothing to do with the tests that are coming and going. I am all the same. I am the screen on which this show is happening. Often Yogananda used to, and in fact, Rama, uh, it was I think Ramakrishna Paramahansa who used to give this example. He said, "Okay, take the example of the." movie screen now on the movie screen you see so much happening there's a battle going on you know tanks and missiles are being fired there's fire there's water flowing on the screen you imagine all those visuals but does the water on the screen wet the screen doesn't the fire doesn't burn it and after the movie show the screen is just the same although everything has happened if in those three hours you have seen so much happening and Ramakrishna used to say that you are that screen on which it's all happening and it will just come and go. But are you anchored in that state of consciousness? Are you, do you realize that you are that? Do you realize that? And do you practice that I am that consciousness on which this play of thoughts is happening? So that will be the final thing which will come. But also I want to add here because there is one more thing which I read just two days ago, which will help us in our tests. So not only these five S's are going to help because this will help uh, build our sadhana, those four pillars. And that sadhana will give us the self control and santosha. And finally, you understand who you are. So this will definitely help us to uh, go through our tests. But there is one more important thing which I read. Uh, very uh, recently and I didn't realize that this is so important and this is a, it's a teaching from Bhagavad Gita from the sixth chapter let me just read what Yogananda says here the Bhagavad Gita teaches that he who thinks negatively and beholds evil in the world is the enemy of his self and the self acts as his enemy and he who beholds only goodness is a friend to his self and the self acts as his friend. I never realized that this was so important because you see, there is so much evil that you can see now in the world happening. Even when you don't want it, the evil is being bombarded onto you, even either through the news or through the, you know, happenings or so much. But then the Bhagavad Gita is very clear. If you are beholding evil, if you are thinking negative, he said, you are the enemy of your own self and the self will also act like an enemy to you. I mean, this is like, which is what we say in Hindi. I mean, who in his sane mind 
will like to do that. But then on the other hand, he says, if you are beholding goodness, you are a friend to his self and the self will also act as friend. Further, Yogananda write, by seeking out evil, by being negative and affirming to yourself negative thoughts, you see this world as a forest of fear. This is what exactly we are in. If you just think the geopolitical situation today, you will realize that it is nothing but a forest of fear. But by seeking goodness, by being good, and by affirming good, you see this world as a garden of beauty. Now that choice lies with us. Either we want to see it as a forest of fear, or as a garden of beauty. And Yogananda gave another analogy. He said, why don't you become like a honey bee? He said, honey bee is always interested in the honey. It always goes to the flowers to pick up the rasa, the honey. It's not like the restless housefly and which will flit on anything. So he said, become like a honey bee because God is the honey. Wherever you find honey, whether in the good qualities in a human being, appreciate those, be with them add to their good qualities by adding your own goodness everybody has some good quality even when there are many times you know when you when you feel a dislike towards a particular person or let's say a particular situation but if you will dive deeper even in that person you will find something good some goodness and you can help it will help you to you know nurture that goodness in yourself there is another uh, story in the bhagavad gita in the mahabharata when Krishna and Pandavas were going in a forest and uh, there was this, in the forest, there was this dog, which was very uh, badly wounded. There were fleas everywhere on the skin of the dog. It was in very much uh, agony and pain. There was a lot of foul smell coming out from the dog. And so Pandavas asked Krishna him a question. Krishna, you always tell us to see goodness in every situation. What should I, what should we see in this dog? It has nothing but all foul smell everywhere. And um, we are, we are, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are at a loss to see any goodness here. And Krishna said, can't you see the teeth of that dog? They are brimming white and they are, you know, shining and uh, they are still keeping their luster. And immediately Pandavas realized that even in that situation, there was that ray of light, that goodness element there. And Krishna wanted them to focus only on that. So let me just conclude this evening satsang, which was a beautiful topic that how should we meet our tests by the five S's that we remember, which will help us to give us these three siddhis. And at the same time, by always looking at the light, by always seeing the goodness and it will sail you through and let me conclude this by yogananda's words when he said no one else can save you you are your own savior as soon as you realize that i am light itself darkness was never meant for me it can never cover the light of my soul now this is very important that bit by bit you will realize that this is what uh, we have to do and also at one point uh, Yogananda said that let your eyes behold only that which is beautiful so that the ugliness of evil will disappear from your consciousness so aren't those words beautiful because whatever ugliness we are able to see around is nothing because maybe that ugliness is somewhere in our consciousness and that is why we are able to focus on anything ugly outside us so let us conclude this satsang with a with an arti and a prayer and uh, always feel that you know let us help let god helps us in remaining in the light focus on the light only on the goodness so that we can see this world as nothing but a garden of beauty